Welcome to Red Tiger Chronicles. This is Sifu Paul Mason, owner of Red Tiger Martial Arts in Cincinnati, Ohio, and this podcast is to help some of the most extraordinary martial artists that walk among us tell us their stories. Hi, welcome to Red Tiger Chronicles. Today we have with us Grandmaster Benny Ming of the Shaolin Wing Chun Art, the founder of that art and the owner operator of the Wing Chun Museum and Ming's Martial Arts International headquartered in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, just a little bit about Grandmaster Ming. He is a 73rd generation descendant of the philosopher Mengchus, a direct successor to Confucius. In 1970, he started his martial arts training in Hong Kong, studying Judo. He did Taekwondo uh, starting in 1974 under Grandmaster Y.C. Kim. In 1982, he began his Wing Chun Kung Fu training in Hong Kong under the movie star Sifu Li Hui Sung. In 1985, he uh, started training full-time under Sifu Moyat while living in New York City. And in 1986, he officially started teaching Kung Fu. It was in 1993 that the Wing Chun Museum was established in Dayton, Ohio, and he is a sixth degree black belt in Taekwondo, a certified instructor in Krav Maga, an instructor of Hung Fai Yi Wing Chun, a recognized instructor in Chi Sim Wing Chun. And in 2008, he began studying teaching the Hoki Boen Eng Chun system. He is a certified Cobra self-defense instructor, and in 2013, he received an instructor certification from the Shaolin Temple. As previously stated, he is the founder of the Wing Shaolin Wing Chun system. So welcome, Grandmaster Ming. Uh, did I miss anything? Oh, first of all, thank you, Paul. Uh, no, you cover a lot. <laughs> <laughs> good to know. Good to know. So in your own words, um, tell me a little bit about what made you start that martial arts journey what kind of put the bug in your head to start training and why have you stuck with it uh, all these years to to the level you are right now um i started in martial art when i was 10. it's kind of you know growing up in hong kong born and raised in hong kong of course the big icon bruce lee i remember watching bruce lee's uh, movie in a the theater and you know as a youngster i was like i'm just looking for the fight, the action. At the end of the movie, I remember it's like everyone stood up and had a standing ovation. I was like, wow. So, and I started to pick up who Bruce Lee was. So That's when right. I walk into the movie theater, I didn't know who, like, I didn't even know which guy <laughs> is this in the, uh, in the screen. So Bruce Lee was always kind of in the back of my mind, but, um, uh, interesting part about Hong Kong in the 70s or in the 60s, uh, the martial art community, uh, some of them are mixed in with the, what we call the triads. Yes, sir. Uh, today, you know, triads, if you Google it, it's kind of related to Chinese mafia. So my parents would not let me study Kung Fu. Sir. But I always want to study Kung Fu, especially with the uh, influence from Bruce Lee. So then I started martial art. That's why I started with judo. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, then at 10, I started, uh, I quit within the second belt. It was kind of tough. Yeah, because uh, train the traditional way, all you learn is to be a dummy for somebody to fall, <laughs> to throw. So now I so, realize the wisdom, you got to learn how to fall first, right? But for a 10, 11 year old kid, that wasn't too fun. So I quit. Yes, so I was uh, just kind of, uh, looking for lessons and, uh, then 13 year old, we move here to the States, whole family moved and, uh, we operate the first Chinese restaurant in Centerville, Ohio. And, uh, months after that, there was a group of Asian men came in and, uh, for dinner and my dad came over to me and said, Hey, hey, there's your chance to learn Kung Fu. So he introduced me to this four Asian, uh, instructors. But my dad doesn't know the difference. Sure. So they end up to be Taekwondo grandmasters. Sure. So my second art was in Taekwondo. Okay. And uh, so I gotten pretty good with it. I competed and uh, did some Chinese martial art, but more on uh, just 
you know, s- some Chinese student going to Rice State, UD, I got to know them. And then anybody with some background, they would teach me. I w- want to learn. Yes, sir. Okay. So this is kind of like my beginning in my teenage years. But I heavily competed at that moment. So after high school, I wasn't sure what I wanted to study in college. Uh, so I thought of going back to China to really learn the art that I want to learn. Yes, I wasn't sure what art. So um, I was going to go to uh, actually having an exchange program with the Beijing Sports University, but the tuition fee was too expensive because in China, they have physical uh, educational program, four years degree in martial arts. Okay, but I didn't. So then I went back uh, to Hong Kong, you know, still have relatives there. Uh, so that's how I started my official Chinese Kung Fu journey. Sir. Uh, going there for full time, so I have all day to train. So I started with Tai Chi, uh, Prime Mantis, and Wing Chun. So those are the first three arts oh, that wow. I study. All right. Cool. Cool deal. Yeah, I just, a uh, couple of things you said, I just want to kind of qualify. You said you were pretty good at Taekwondo, and I, I think pretty good means that you were on the Junior Olympic team, right? You were on the... <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit more than pretty, yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Uh, you know, also another reason I started uh, training is because uh, uh, I have pretty bad asthma. Oh, I have mm. a bad asthma since I was a kid. So my endurance always weak. Yes, sir. But uh, as I started training, uh, like, I think I have a seven state title yes, sir. in Taekwondo. So at the state, uh, I beat everyone. Yes, sir. Uh, and there could be like 10 guys in the weight division. But by the time you go to national, there could be 30 guys. Yeah. So I uh, didn't place at the nationals due to the fact uh, that I ran out of gas. Mm-hmm. But on a technical base, I beat people that won at the national. You know, Ohio is an interesting state. I think there's like three to four Olympians Sir. in Taekwondo. Mm-hmm. And two of them I spar and beat at the state level. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of uh, yeah, a little bit about the Taekwondo it's background. Shit. When you, you're having, you have more matches and you have to have more endurance, it was harder right. for you to keep up with it. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted people to understand what pretty good means in <laughs> yeah. this, this context. It's not, <laughs> you know, he, he, he won a, a local tournament here and there. It's it, He was state state level successful mm-hmm. and, and beat internationally uh ranked competitors um the other thing i thought was was interesting is uh oh, your parents your parents were talking about the triads and um martial arts and, and it made me think about um i was i was talking to my mom one day and she's like what are you doing and you know i had this sticks out and i said i'm, I'm doing a screamer and she just shook her head and said Psh. Only gangsters do that, <laughs> right? So it's like it's weird. Like in the in Asian in the Asian community, like one of the most culturally significant things, martial arts is kind of this, you know, taboo thing, and hmm. a lot of I guess um, societies. So I just yeah. thought that was that that's was interesting because like a, a lot of martial arts, like the the thing is to be a better person. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I so think it has, it's not for thugs. I yeah. think it has the opposite context it, for American people. It's like, yeah. oh, my child wants to do martial arts. Great. They're going to have structure and mm-hmm. get out energies. This will be great for them. It's a completely different view. So that that being said, um, I got one of my, my pre-planned questions here, and I wrote it out because I didn't want to be – I wanted to be articulate and try not to offend and stuff. But um, to my knowledge, your parents did not have a martial arts background. Yet you have been training, studying, teaching martial arts for the great majority of your life, going so far as to be a system creator. I cannot imagine coming from an Asian household that any of this would have been possible without the support as well as the encouragement of your parents. Why do you think they were not more concerned with trying to push you in the direction of a more conventional career? And what advice would you give to the parents of children who want to follow their dreams that may not line up with their parents' expectations? Well, you know, um, most of the, you know, as an immigrant family, 
you know, you know, if I have to ask, Dan, why do you like move us here, right? Yeah. Because actually Hong Kong is a big metropolitan, right? So we thought, you know, US is this huge, big city um, state. Yeah. Okay, and then we moved to Dayton, Ohio. It's like nothing here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, the point is that, you know, uh, especially being uh, uh, Asian uh, culture wise, okay, you want your kids to have a, a high level education. Mm -hmm. So you come here for uh, uh, for sure you want to finish college okay, mm -hmm. and get a master's degree and PhD degree and so forth and so forth, right? Yeah. So in, in, in Asia, Generally speaking, the parents focus more on the academic side mm -hmm. of their developments. They don't really focus or encourage their kids to do anything physical, right? Anything actual be like in music or mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. right? Where in the West, you know, uh, you know, when I came, martial arts is already very popular in the U.S., mm -hmm. right? And I think uh, especially the competitive side. Uh, but, um, you know, I think it has to do with the icon movie like uh, Karate Kid yes, mm -hmm. and that kind of brought out the philosophical side of martial art. Mm -hmm. So the whole industry kind of picks up that, you know what, the martial art is for life skills, for personal developments. Mm -hmm. So that became a strong part of the martial art industry in the u.s mm -hmm. and it took off ever since the fighting part of it is still there the competition part is still there okay um but to me obviously you know now in our system we call this the tiger and the dragon mm -hmm. you gotta have your dragon okay be able to be educated be able to think for yourself uh it, you know uh to to uh to uh, develop yourself mentally, then the tiger just as important, which is any part of the physical training. Mm -hmm. okay? As I said, that physical is also a form of intelligence. Uh, so if you say, you know, that's why in my family now, mm -hmm. you know, I have three boys, uh, it is a requirement to train in martial art, so. just like it is by law, you have to go to school uh, until you're 18. <laughs> The same thing here. Okay. By the time they turn 18, if they want to completely stop, that's their choice. Yes, sir. But I experienced that the value of the martial art. It gave me the discipline, the self-control, the confidence, and a deep thinking process uh, and the physical experience. So I know the value of that. So I want to make sure that my kid has that too. Yes, sir. But as a formal education, okay? what I teach my kids is exactly what I teach to my students. So, uh, you know, I wish that this is part of our educational system. Sure. Because of the, like I said, the life skill part of it. Yes, sir. You know, the mm -hmm. battlefields out there in the real life. So. Mm -hmm. I definitely wish I would have uh, started doing martial arts when I was younger. It's like completely changed my life and completely changed my outlook on the world. Uh, and I, I definitely think I would have benefited from it if I had done it when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. On the subject. Or on the subject of um, you know martial arts self improvement, I was wondering about when when you did immigrate to the U.S. Uh, what nineteen seventies or so how how did your martial art I guess practice or did it influence or affect your experience of transitioning from you know, being a, a Chinese person from Hong Kong or kid from Hong Kong to, you know, now you're in the Midwest of America, because I, I feel like there was a potential for a culture shock there. Right. Did the, was there a culture shock? I mean, how, how, how much of a culture shock was there and did the martial arts kind of help ease that or, or take some of the, the pressure off that? Yeah, that's uh, actually uh, a good question because uh, my sister is one year older than me. You know, I came here, I think it was 13, so she's 14. You know, as teenagers, right, you're looking for identity. Sure. And we went from a complete different environment to, uh, like you said, uh, cultural shock included, right? So the level of English I had when I came was ABC. Sure. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so I had to learn the language, learn the culture, and, and also, you know, uh, we moved to Centerville. 
and it's primarily you know Caucasian white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So me and my sister were the first Asian in the school system. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine how that goes, right? Oh, I know. So how make, the, make, the, <laughs> <laughs> make the long story short, my sister had a terrible time, had a hard time, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, to just kind of uh, uh, try to assimilate to the new environment. Yeah. Well, because I practice martial art, and that kind of indirectly uh, funneled me into more focus on martial art, Sorry. and you know. Uh, kids are mean sometimes, yeah. mm -hmm. and during the middle school, high school, I defended myself, right. or later on, I actually become the guy that was causing trouble because <laughs> I was like pretty good with the fighting part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, actually, um, martial art become kind of my focus, gotcha. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that uh, helped me transition a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally get it. I, I think, yeah, I, I wish I had done martial arts or had an exposure to martial arts when I was a kid. I think, I mean, definitely as we were talked about on, on the episode say, you did with you me, it. yeah, it would have been uh, huge for the dragon side and Thai tiger side, I think. Cause I, I mean, I was born here, but you know, I grew up, grew up in the South. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was the only in elementary school, I was the only Asian kid or you know even though I was, i'm like half asian and my mom's filipino and and people didn't know like i just got picked on from both sides mm -hmm. it was terrible i it was terrible and then when i went to middle school there was a, it didn't get any better because there was a there were two korean kids i mean not related like a boy and a girl and the boy he was really good at football which i was not you know and then the girl was like really smart she was like really good at academics right mm -hmm. and so they had they found their niches and i'm just like you know wandering searching for identity like master master ming said mm -hmm. so yeah that's um yeah if anybody's listening get your kid if they're your kids having any issues get them in martial arts asap i think um one thing i was thinking about i was trying to keep these questions individualized but um i mean there's so much inaccurate information out there and I know you've, you've addressed this among the members of your organization, but I, I just feel like I have to ask this. Who created Wing Chun? Well, um, see, number one, uh, uh, that's a big question because Wing Chun is multidimensional. There's mm -hmm. a technical side, you know, there is the uh, culture side, there's a history side, there's a philosophical side, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so in order to really understand who created Wen Chun, you really have to done your research or actually understand the experience firsthand to have uh, the multi-dimensional picture. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh well let's before I can tell you that who created Wen Chun, my background is started with Wen Chun. And my first Sifu Lei Hoi Sang, he's actually coming from Jiu Wan's lineage. Jiu Wan's lineage traced back to Chen Yumin. Chen Yumin is actually Chen Wa Sun's son. Mm. Chen Wa Sun is actually Yi Man's Sifu. Yes, sir. So that uh, my first lineage is slightly different mm. from the mainstream Yi Man system. Yes, my second main teacher was Sifu Moyat, of course, and he really one of the uh, main representative of the, uh, the Yemen system. So, so, um, so I already noticed there's a big difference just within the two lineages. So by the time I started uh, doing research due to the, as a curator of the Wenchim Museum, I started to go up to the uh, history. So who created Wenchim? Well, who was Yemen's teacher, Tan Wasun? So I went to that village, uh, interacted, study with their group. And today, this group of Wen Chen still there. Okay, Chen Yu means Wen Chen still yes. there in China. Then who taught Chen Yu, uh, Chen Wa Sun is Liang Zhan. So I went uh, deeper and then went back to find out oh, that lineage is still around. Okay, mm -hmm. Liang Zhan. It's called Kulo Wen Chen. It's different. Uh, it's a, in a different lineage. So every time I do that, it's kind of like a, a timeline going backwards. Sure. Okay. 
So if I study uh, Gulo Wenchen, Liang Zhang's Wenchen, then that means I'm studying a Wenchen that is actually uh, been practiced in 1800s. Sure. Then I went back. So who taught Liang Zhang? So Liang Zhang was taught by the opera people. Okay. So Liang Zhang, uh, now during the 1800s, it's not like Wen Chen is very popular because it's actually uh, still very unknown. Liang Zhang was credited to kind of make Wen Chen famous because it's challenge matches. Sure. Supposedly he met the challenge, never lost. But his teacher, uh, they're not like commercialized teacher have school. His teacher were the opera guys. Okay. And the opera guys coming from the red boats. So. Okay. So the red boat was traveling opera, Cantonese opera group with three boats, heaven, human, earth, three boats going around as the entertainers. Right. So I look into that and that Wen Chen system still around. Today is called Hei Ban Wen Chen or Hong Xun Wen Chen. Mm. So now every time I look into the past, I, the, the legacy of that still around. It's just that it give you an older version of what is Wen Chen. Yes, sir. Then it become <clears throat> uh, interesting because after that, uh, what is before that, it become very difficult to find. And so, so far from the opera down to Leung Zhan, Leung Zhan to Tsang Wa to Yiman, this is what I call the public Wen Chen. And they use the history based on the nun taught the Kung Fu to this girl, and her name is Yi Mun Chen. Sure. Okay, and this historical aspect uh, still continues today. Sure. So, so who created Wen Chen? Oh, this girl called Yi Mun Chen learning from a nun, right? Okay. Uh, so I, as a researcher, I number one, I look at the timeline. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, number one, there is no Shaolin nuns in any of the Shaolin temple. It's just not part of the culture. There is Shaolin nun that visit the temple, but there are never a nun actually stay at the temple. It's all males. Monastery. Right? Monastery. That's both true in the Northern temple and the Southern temple. I mean, this is hi history. You can sure. look up the fact, right? So number two, uh, look at the timeline. The Qing dynasty and the Ming dynasty struggles uh, was uh, in the 1600s, okay? And the Southern Temple was destroyed in the 1600s. If you use that timeline, there's no way that Yi Wenchen appears in the 1800s. So there is like a 200-year gap. Well, she'd be 200 years old at least. Right? <laughs> okay. um, <clears throat> and also culturally, if you look at the story, well, you know, um, the temple was destroyed. The nun was one of the five elders, so she went into hiding, and she heard that this girl was bullied into a marriage. So she came out of hiding and teach her kung fu to defend herself. Okay, now imagine you're the most wanted in China back in the days. Okay, uh, the the rebels were being killed and captured. Right? Mm -hmm. Why would you come out and expose yourself? Mm -hmm. If you expose yourself like this, you basically also put her life in danger too. Okay, so politically, it doesn't make sense. Now, culturally, also doesn't make sense because this is in the Qing Dynasty, in the old China days. Uh, if a girl have a chance to marry upwards mm -hmm. into a more wealthy family, I mean, it was a blessing. Mm -hmm. right? uh, girls back in the days, they don't have really this marriage for romantic reasons. My grandma was arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. My mother was arranged marriage. Wow. <laughs> okay. Wow. So this notion of like, well, I don't have any romantic feeling. I, you know, I read it to have a fight with you. Uh, it's also culturally, historically, timeline wise. Uh, and also there's no trace, uh, uh record of the mm -hmm. person, her husband, mm -hmm. Chen, or the nun. Okay. So this is kind of where I discover in the public. It's not until I discover who formed this uh, opera Wenchen was the secret society, mm -hmm. which is took us to the the triads. Mm -hmm. Okay, back then triads was heaven, human, earth created in the Shaolin Temple uh, as a rebel force. But today, 
you know, the public uh, kind of known triads with the criminal elements mm -hmm. after 300 some years, right? Yeah. Okay. So those two lineage gave me the rest of the information. Okay. Um, but regardless, we don't have a time machine to go back. Okay. So this is something you have to, uh, based on logics and research and information, when you start putting all of the pieces together, my research points out that it was a high level Shaolin warriors monk with the remnants of the main military sure. uh, and uh, the loyalists coming from the martial art community. Three separate groups combined force to form the secret society. Now, during time of war, you have to improve your fighting. Sure. And the results is Wen Chun. Because Wen Chun is not a brand new system. It's what they took what they have, improved it by making it more efficient. Mm -hmm. So Wen Chun represents efficiency of fighting. Uh, so this is my current conclusion. Sure. Okay. And due to the secret society, they, I find out Yim Wen Chun was actually a secret code. Yim in Chinese means discreet, secretive. Mm -hmm. Wen to sing, to praise, to talk, Chun was a spring. So if you put Yim Wen Chun name together to be discreet, secretive, keep praising and talking about the spring and what does spring symbolize? Rebirth. Obviously, they're talking about the rebirth of the Ming Dynasty. Sure. Okay, and also I found out the secret code of the Mui. Mui is not an actual name of a nun, it's actually represent the five combat skills coming from the Shaolin Temple. Sir. So if you put those two together, yes, Wen Chun did come from the Shaolin. So if you like the metaphor of girl and nun, it's still true because the girl's Kung Fu come from the nun. Sir. But in a more of a logical term, the new system coming from Shaolin, which is a Mui, uh -huh. went to Wen Chun. So you you can use the, the, the I guess I, you could say myth of the nun and the girl as, as a, I mean, it's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not that it's not, it's bad. It's just, it's a metaphor. It's not to be taken literally. Right. Not only you have to understand uh, that as a metaphor, even during the time uh, of the opera, uh, they find out the opera were involved with as a part of the rebel force. So they kill off almost all the uh, opera people. So it makes sense to create some kind of myth to hide any form of the truth, any form of the history. So it's very convenient, you know, to say, "Oh, you mention, oh, it's not a, mar it's just a girl." Sure. You know, it makes sense for for, for that practical purpose mm -hmm. as well. Yes, sir. So I was just, I was thinking. You mentioned you had mentioned Bruce Lee before, and this is going to be, this is going to be kind of a possibly a dumb westerner question <laughs> but what does it say if anything about wing chun that the most famous practitioner didn't complete the system and i don't i don't want to i'm not meaning to be disrespectful or anything because right. i love wing chun right. but i'm just curious if if that says anything about the art or the the methodology of teaching or the any type of social or cultural uh, impacts that that might influence the the way things are. Well, you know, number one is always the person. If you put uh, uh, Bruce Lee in Japan, grew up as a karate guy, he would have probably become the best karate guy. Sir. Okay, so it is uh, when it comes to the art, it's always the person. Bruce Lee had uh, started when he was young too. But he and among his Kung Fu brothers, uh, they, as uh, teenagers, you know, troublemakers in the street of Hong Kong, they, they like to see if this stuff really works. Sorry. So in the early, early stage, they were out there doing challenge matches. So that means they have experience of fighting. Okay, so that is very important because when it comes to Wen Chun, number one, Wen Chun is a martial art. So you have to, uh, and it's a Shaolin martial art. You have to understand about uh, fighting because it's martial art and then coming from Shaolin. And, and Bruce Lee not only gained experience when he was young, so simultaneously he was learning the system. But when he was in Ceiling Tao's uh, uh, stage, uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, which is the beginning stage of Wen Chen, he already like fighting out there. Yes, sir. Okay. And as he progressed, getting more older, he started understanding the depth of martial art. And he realized Wen Chen was what it is. It is a concept-based art. Sir. So not a technical specialty art, right? Mm -hmm. For example, if we say Jujutsu, that's technical art. Boxing is a technical art, right? They specialize in certain areas. Where Wen Chen is the art of fighting with efficiency. Uh, so it doesn't specialize in any technique. But if you can bring anything up to a level of efficiency, and it's, that is part of Wen Chun. So he understands that concept. So he don't have this restriction. Sure. Uh, Wen Chun, you got to look certain ways. Uh, but in Hong Kong, he studied the classical Yiman system and close quarter, we call the trapping range. Okay. Uh, and even today's community, most people don't understand why Wen Chun fight at that distance. Yes, Maybe later we can talk about that, right? For sure. But in, in realms of fighting, you have to understand you could fight people with weapons or empty hand long range, or could be at a personal space, or if you clinch, you're probably going to end up on the ground. This is fighting. Okay, so that means you cannot say uh, fighting, you know, uh, I just want to do this, I just want It's not a preference. Sure. So that's why ultimate fighting is what uh, MMA have proven. You got to know the whole package. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bruce Lee contained the practical experience with his smart philosoph philosophical thoughts so he took Wen Chun actually much deeper because if you understand the nature of Wen Chun. But yes, historically, he did not complete the system. He came to the U.S., I believe, when he was 18. Uh, he was just at the wooden dummy stage or, or about to begin. So that means he didn't learn the system, the complete system sure. uh, from Yip Man. But by the time he came to the U.S., uh, being a mixed martial art culture he quickly adapted sure. and and uh, he had an early mat uh, challenge match in chinatown and he realized uh his limitation even sure. though he won the fight so he quickly adapted and gotten the rest of the tools that he need to bring him at the level as what we call a complete fighter yes sir um yeah as you talk i've probably got five, six, ten questions rattling around in my head. I'm trying to stop one. So I know in, in, in the art of Shaolin Wing Chun, we talk about five martial arts activities. The first three are the treasures of Shaolin, self-improvement, health, uh, self-defense, and the last two are sports and games and, and entertainment. And, you know, sports and entertainment, that's usually how a lot of people get exposed to martial arts or learn about martial arts in the first place. So I was thinking about, um, you were talking about your first exposure was watching that Bruce Lee movie. Are there any films that you would recommend that, that show a, a good depiction of Wing Chun? Uh, now, of course, when we talk about Wing Chun movies, now there's like at least 10 movies in the past, what, five to 10 years, starting with Donnie Yoon's. And then there's like uh, at least 10. And, uh, uh, before that, there were some classical movies on Wen Chun. Right? Two of them I would recommend is called Warriors 2 yes, and then also The Prodigal Son. Okay. Those mm -hmm. two are the classic Wen Chun. Now, uh, the actor, uh, Jackie Chan, Si Hing, which is Sammy Hong, yes, sir. Right? the big guy. Yes, sir. Actually, you know, uh, if you see all the Wen Chun movies in the movies, they actually were choreographed by my Sifu. Wow. Okay, and and Sammy Hong, uh, you know, they are actually coming from the opera schools, right, Jackie Chan. So they study all martial arts. But personally, Sammy Hong liked Wen Chun, so he took that uh, a little bit further. And there are a few movies I don't remember the name of the movie. Mm -hmm. He did tremendous uh, fighting scenes with Wen Chun. Uh, uh, I just have to find that. You said it's a name. Jackie Chan movie, though. No, it's or not a Sammo Hung movie. Sammo Hung movie. Hung. Okay. Yeah, he plays uh, 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 two characters in the same movie. One okay. is a ghost, and one is uh, it's a father. Okay. So it's 
Uh, but definitely the Warriors 2 and Prodigal Son were the two classics before the Yip Months movies nowadays. All right. So you guys know what to <laughs> add to your watch list. So I gave them yes, like sir. a few movies that they should watch that kind of embody the spirit of Kung Fu, either Tiger or Dragon. So now you got a couple more that, mm. that you can watch. Um, speaking of movies, I don't know how much you want to talk about it or if you can talk about it. I don't know how this stuff kind of works, but... Uh, you're involved in a production of a movie right now. Is that correct? Correct. So far, you know, Wen Chen is one of the most popular systems, right? Uh, started with Bruce Lee, now Yip Man, so it, it's household word. But all the movies uh, of Wen Chen come from Asia so far, either from Hong Kong or China, right? So I'm in a project of uh, having the first American-made Wen Chen movie. Uh, it's uh, funded for uh, Blockbuster, uh, Warren Brothers, Sony. Okay, it's going to be um, uh, big screen movies. Okay. Uh, so uh, we should. We are already in pre-production. Okay. But I can't tell you at this moment because we are actually getting some. Um, Big names in the movie, sure. So it's not until that's final that we can expose it. But it's historical because it's going to be the first uh, movie actually funded and promoted in Hollywood. That's yeah, that's exciting, and that's understandable that you can't divulge too many details. You, you're are you choreographing the fights? Are you kind of well? This uh, this another special about the movie is that we will have big names, big uh, entertainment names in the movie, but there will be also uh, real grandmasters of Wen Chen also will be featured. Uh, I'm one of them. Uh, there are many others too. And there will be fighters that are also Wen Chen, highly skilled in Wen Chen. So, so you got the authentic Wen Chen community involved as well as the uh, actors and actresses. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. That's awesome. So, yeah, we're talking about a little bit about the entertainment aspect. <clears throat> I do want to. This is this is kind of hard for me to bring up. This is, I think, a pain point for a lot of Wing Chun practitioners or even maybe Chinese martial arts practitioners. But um, I think it's something that should be addressed is uh, Wing Chun and sports like Wing Chun and, and combat sports. A lot of the videos we see, it, it doesn't turn out well for that person. And I was just wondering what like I kind of know from from studying uh being in the art, why that is. But I think um, a lot of listeners might not know or uh, have our perspective. And I was just trying to see if you could elaborate a little bit about why a lot of so-called Wing Chun practitioners aren't successful in combat sports such as MMA, or um, do you see a place for Wing Chun in MMA? Well, number one, right? Actually, uh, earlier you mentioned the five martial activities. Sure. The original uh, functional Wen Chen was, this is a Buddhist art. This is coming from Shaolin Temple. It was, was to enhance and build and develop uh, their human potentials, right? The monks practice martial art for reality, for spiritual cultivations, and, and for higher purpose, right? So <clears throat> personal development is a big part. So today, you have, uh, and Wen Chen is highly intelligent art. It attract a lot of uh, uh, adults with, you know, uh, they they like the philosophical, the knowledge part, the wisdom part of Wen Chun. So, but if you talk about that group of people, right, from 30s all the way to 60s, 70s, right, they're the average people want to get fit, want to mm -hmm. learn some self defense, but they want to learn the whole art because they love the the, the system. So. You're talking about a group of people that is not really interested in fighting. So they're happy with uh, learning self-defense and learning the skill. But when I say fighting, okay, there's two uh, areas that you can really test yourself. Right? One is not really a test. I'm either you get jumped on the street, you find out the reality of fighting mm -hmm. right at that moment. But the mentality is different, right? You want to escape. You want to be safe. You want to, you don't, it's not a match, right? right? Okay, so that is not a testing ground 
for any art to test their skill. Sure. Today, they just call one finger Kung Fu, right? Just mm -hmm. squeeze the trigger, yeah. right? Okay. So that means there is only one area for martial artists to test out their Kung Fu today. It's either in your gym where you test out among each other or you test out in the martial art community. And today that's called competition. All right. You can go as far as MMA. So MMA is not a system, uh, a particular style. It's arena to test out your skill. Sure. Right. So, so that come back to Wen Chun, right? So if the most of the Wen Chun, let's say if I teach Wen Chun and most of my clients are professional people, they're not going to need to put on full gears and spar and then have a broken nose, right? That might, uh, might affect their career or whatever, right? So it comes down to the person. Uh, and number two is the way that you teach, the way you train. If you come in in your 20s and say, I want to, you know, test myself. Sure. I want to fight, uh, really develop the skill. Then you got to train how to fight. The, it, it comes down, to, it's not about the art. It's how you teach, how you train. And third is the person, right? If I open up a school and nobody wants to fight, then I cannot force them to fight. Mm -hmm. Now, if I do teach fighting and people want to fight, then the methods of training has to be uh, towards that goal which is not the same as if you just want to get in shape, mm -hmm. right? So it has to do, uh, when Chen doesn't fare well in today's fighting environments, you go back, if you wa just watch the video, number one, the Wen Chen fighter is not even athletic. Number two, you can tell they never spar or fight. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not about the art. This guy got beat up because he's not a fighter, fighting a fighter. So if you have a fighter beating up somebody who's not a fighter, you know, that is the reality rather than, oh, Wen Chen got beat up. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so, uh, my school is a proof. We have fighters that can fight. Sir. And we are a Wen Chen school. Yes, sir. So if anybody, you know, say, hey, Wen Chen can fight. Well, if you come to my school, we will give you a different opinion. Yes, sir. Right. So because the way we train, the way we teach is based on the activities of martial art, right? If you just want to um, uh, get fit, that is not the same thing as having full contact fight. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm getting is like the art, the art shallow wing chun. It's kind of a a one stop shop. There could there should be something for everyone, but it's up to the individual to decide what's more important to them. Mm -hmm. Correct, because, uh, you know, when China originally developed during the wartime, and during that time, those people were meant to kill each other. So the art were meant for killing. Yes, okay, you know, for high level people to fight for their country, uh, uh, life and death is what they train for. Mm -hmm. So today, people are not training Wen Chen for life and death, <laughs> right? Hope so, so that's why we try to really a Pomo Wen Chun for people that can benefit Wen Chun because uh, Wen Chun can benefit the kids by teaching them discipline, can benefit an elder by teaching them the body intelligence, coordination, sensitivity, reaction, all of that, right? Sure. But it can also uh, uh, give a fighter an edge, putting the uh, Wen Chun concept in there, you know, high level efficiency, how do you use two hands and two feet simultaneously, right? Mm -hmm. If you can put kicking, striking, take down submission, two hand and two feet all together, that only happened in one space. Sure. That's the Wen Chun short distance. So these people have to understand Wen Chun we do, the things that we do is based on the combat concept, not because of certain looks. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, you're talking about the origins of Wing Chun and how it started as a self-defense art of wartime. Or are you still researching lineages in Wing Chun? Um, or are you, uh, did you reach a stopping point in that? Well, we know that the, um, after the burning of the temple, the secret society tried it broken into five groups. And today we know them as five flags. <laughs> we identified two of the flags which is Wen Chen related, the black flag and the red flag. Sure. The white flag possibly is the Bat Mei system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the yellow flag 
is the sun praying mantis system. Mm -hmm. So the only color uh, is the green flag that we don't have information on what martial art is related to it. But basically our research part is done because we gotten down to the principle. So once we discover the formula, the principle, then you know there could be variations out there, but there will be nothing new. Sir. Okay. Because the, the physics doesn't change. Okay. What changes, you know, like I say, is the person that's expressing the art. But the art is based on reality, which is a science. So we discovered the phys physics, the physical laws of Wing Chun, which give Wing Chun the efficiency. So therefore, we're not really worried about, oh, is there uh, any more missing pieces? Mm -hmm. The only part is the history part of it. We can always use more information. Okay. But on a technical side, we are complete when it comes to research. Okay. That's why we enter this, uh, this stage. We want to test out the theories sure. because mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the knowledge part is a theory. So we are heavily invested in putting time into uh, training fighters that can express this level of skill. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering, too, what, what is the um, what do you think is the most valuable lesson that, that you you have been able to teach people over the years? Because I know you've been doing this a long time. What what do you think kind of sticks out? What gives you the most satisfaction? What do you think that most people can can benefit from? like any type of tiger or dragon lesson probably from martial arts well a uh, martial art is a whole you know every martial art uh, i'm talking about traditional martial art so that means there is the body mind and personal cultivation spiritual side to it uh, if you learn the traditional side of art it can always help uh, the individual as a mm -hmm. person to enhance himself to face the real battle which is every day Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not like every day we need to look over our shoulder physically being attacked. But, you know, for some people, waking up is a challenge. Right. Mm -hmm. Going to work is a challenge. Right. Trying new things is a challenge. You know, going for the next uh, promotion is a challenge. So we want to give the warrior spirits okay. uh, to people where they can maximizing their uh, short okay. life. We call it here and now yes, in this planet. So, uh, of course, I'm biased towards the Wing Chun methods, mm -hmm. Wing Chun approach, because Wing Chun have that, but we do it in a focus where it allow us to be more efficient. Sure. Okay. By saving time, saving space, saving energy to accomplish or enhance something. You know, like I said, right? Life is short. Sure. Okay. I don't want to uh, do something 30 years and then find out that's not the right way to do it. Okay, so you got to find a practical way. Beyond practical, there is efficiency. And the art of Wing Chun went past efficiency, it reached to the level of maximum efficiency. So I guess the most important lesson you're saying is to teach people how to live in the here and now to appreciate the moment that they're in rather than you know living in the past or uh, you know being depressed about the past or being anxious about what has not yet come to pass. Correct. That's the practical side of Wing Chun to me. You know, the practical side is not, you know, my fists, you know, towards right. going towards your face. The practical side is the here and now, be able to be effective in whatever you do and to bring out the uh, uh, human potential in each one of us. How difficult is that lesson to teach? Do you think that's the most difficult lesson to teach or... Um uh, what has been the most challenging? Well, thing we to have teach? a saying: if you give me the time, I give you the skill. Sir. The difficulty is the people that they don't have the consistency, or they mm -hmm. don't kind of dig deep enough, which require time. Sir, you know, like for example, you know, we teach a lot of kids. Sir, uh, the problem is not the kids; it's the parents. So I don't have time to drive you three times a week. You know, yeah. oh, well, my kids want to do uh, 20 other sports. I let them decide. I mean, this for kids, yeah. you know, you, you, you got to have some guidance, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So how can we bring this kid to a level where they have good focus, good self-discipline, good confidence? You got to challenge them. 
But a lot of time it is when you give them a choice, when they start to lose the fun, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to try something new. Yeah. So we got to have a support system that push the kid uh, where they challenge themselves. Uh, and when they reach to that point, we know we've done our job. Right, right. But it's just like, you know, we, a lot of time, it's not the system. It's not our school. It's the teacher. It's just we never have the opportunity to get the student up to that stage. All right. So I was wondering, as a, as a parent and an in instructor yourself, um, I mean, it kind of makes sense to me, you know, if you have, if you have younger kids, maybe 10 or below, um, you can, you can just tell them, you know, look, you're going to go to this and whether you like it or not, this is, you know, I'm, I'm the parent, you're just going to do this. But when they start to become teenagers, um, like how, how do you guide them? Like if they get to that point where, you know, I don't feel like doing this or I don't want to do this, what, what advice would you have to parents um, or what has worked for you to try to guide them into um, staying the course so they can reap the benefits from the training? Uh, you know, let me back, back up a little bit, right? So if you're talking about younger kids, mm -hmm. I remember my parents did the same thing. Yeah. Oh, my, I don't want to do this anymore. Oh, I want to try something new, right? So today I always tell my parents, Mom, I wish you would have just tell me to stick with it <laughs> rather yeah. than let me quit, right? Yeah. And then if you ask my three boys, they all say today, oh, Dad, I'm so glad that you didn't mm -hmm. give us a choice. Okay. You know, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm so grateful today. Okay. okay. So, uh, yes, the younger kids is actually easier. It's mm -hmm. up to the parents, but the teenagers, yes. The thing is about teenagers, they're looking for their identities sure. and they will go to a group that will support and give them that identity. Sure. So we understand that. And, you know, like our teenage group here, you know, actually, uh, our, fight team uh, in the nation. We, our school produced the best teenage fighters. We call the uh, uh, Junior Worlds Championship, Junior National Championship. They're 17 and under. We have a group of them that are just like really good. Yes, well, we kind of have this support system where they want to be here because they have a group mm. that have the same identity, uh, same interest, uh, if you just have one or two, uh, you know, they don't have that group harmony. Mm -hmm. Or let's say a 15-year-old, they always just train with the adults or they have to train with this 11-year-old. Yeah. They eventually are going to lose interest. Yeah. So there is this um, uh, teenage years identity uh, uh, it plays a big role. So we understand that. So okay. uh took us a few years to get that group together, mm -hmm. but that group is really tight. Uh, otherwise, we see difficulties, yes, okay. because, uh, you know, number one, they have so many activities. Number two, right. they could be easily pulled into different directions. Sir, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, on that subject, um, I mean, I want, I want this podcast to be informational. Uh, I want people to not, e not only learn about me and – the important people in my art and, and other people in the martial arts community. But I think it would be a good service um, to hear if you are, if you are a person um, like most of my students, what, late twenties, early thirties. And you're, you know, I know I, when I was in my mid thirties, that's what brought me to martial arts. Cause I, I didn't have an identity. Um, I was questioning my identity. Um, but if you're a parent of a, a child, you know, in those teens, which is what I love to work with teenagers. What would you say, uh, Sigong, would be some red flags if a, if a parent or an adult goes to a martial arts school? What what are some things that you want to notice so you don't take them to like the wrong place? Um, because I know there's a lot of a lot of places out there that might not operate with the level of integrity that that we aspire to, uh, to put forth. I think especially teenage groups, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we come, f we work through this, uh, against multidimensional approach, right? Okay. Uh, our core is called the first hall. Mm -hmm. We always focus on self-development first, right? Sure. 
positive thinking, positive feeling, positive action. They have to understand the powers from within. So we, if we give them that, sure. half of our job is done. Sure. Everything else is just technical stuff. It's like icing on the cake. So, so really, we start working with the what we call the, the three powers: okay? how you think, how you feel, how you act. Okay, uh, and then we will challenge them. Sure. But it, it, everything is a process, right? Uh, and, and we cannot give them a challenge where they cannot handle, or mm -hmm. we don't want to give them something too easy for them. Right. So it's 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 a planned process, but we have our sequence. First hall mm -hmm. is important. So if we see this talented athlete, seventeen year old kids, has got great techniques, but uh, his uh, internal process, his attitude mm -hmm. about himself is not developed. We always focus on that first, okay. and we can tell right away how far he's going to go or when he's going to quit, just based on that first. Sure. So that is the first. Second, you know, if you look at today's uh, society, right? Not just in the U.S. I travel all mm -hmm. around the world. I see the problem is uh, kids are not not only they're not fit, mm -hmm. they're not healthy, right? You know, mentally, physically, you know, diet wise, it's just they're on an up, uphill battle. Mm -hmm. So once they have a good attitude, we work on them becoming an athlete. Okay. And then the last part is the technical skills. So, so we kind of follow that sequence of, of helping them. Sure. So you're, so from what I'm getting is like, if you go to, if you go to a school and they don't have a method, of self improvement, or they're not tailoring the uh, the experience to address those life skill problems. That's kind of a red flag, right? If you look at uh, even sports arena, right? Mm -hmm. Sports, uh, they uh, a coach or teacher they correct your technique, but they never correct kids' behaviors, right? right. Right, so it's not my job. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in martial art, you're teaching people to fight. So if you just keep correcting their technique, but you don't give them the time and place, when do you right. use this? When do you not use this? Right. So we are actually part of the problems. Okay, right. So that's why uh, we kind of understand. You know, always come back to the person, personal development. Okay, rather than yeah, I can help you with your psychic. But one day you're gonna hurt somebody with that psychic, sure. you know. And, and, and in the street, that's a lot of consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, sir. So, a good martial arts school is gonna help you not only learn how to fight, but it's gonna help you resolve any type of personal, interpersonal issues that you have. It's gonna promote healthy uh, activity, and it's gonna give you some some technical skills and, and good body intelligence. Sure. And if, if it's of a place is missing any of those things, it's probably not the best place for you or your, your child. Right. All right. You know, we all adults always say, Hey, you know what? You need to change your attitude. I don't like your attitude. We really clearly define attitude is the way you think, feel and act. And those three things in our system it is the original shouting triads, internal triad. Sure. Okay. You know, if you're not giving that power uh, inside, then you're going to be influenced, be affected by what's on the outside, right? If I say something, oh, you're really good today, Paul, you feel happy. If next day I say you suck, then you feel bad. So then you're just a yo-yo. Yes, sir. Okay? So you got to be able to take control of those three things. And especially even this is not just a personal development. In a fight, if you first thing is thinking about, you're going to get hurt. I'm going to lose. I'm going to mm -hmm. die today. The battle is already lost, right? So thinking has to be there. And feeling, if you cannot control your feeling, yeah. you're always, always going to lose too. So that's why they're both technical skill as well as life skill. Right. So. Doesn't it, yeah, doesn't it go the other way? So if you're about to get in a fight and you think, oh, I'm going to kill this guy. He should have never, you know, said what he said. And, you know, who is he to insult me like this? So that, that would probably set you up for... Um, right. bad consequences too, right? right. Yeah. Mm, good, good. Um, I think that's all I can think of at the moment. I want to open it up to uh, Alex and our uh, guest, Nikki, and see if you guys have any questions.
Do you have any advice for people who are trying to start martial arts in their late twenties, mid thirties? How do you how do you get to somebody's dragon at that point? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, we actually uh, in the U.S. we have a great martial art industry. You can find almost every system out there for every activities for every purpose, right? So, but sometimes that could be a problem because so much information out there. So, uh, like I said, the basic things what we teach is like you really have to ask what is your end goal, what is your purpose. Now, goal does change. Let's say you want to do martial art because I found it uh, uh, good to stay in shape. Okay, and then one year later you find it uh, a reason much deeper than that, right? So, goal does change. So um, you have to, the person have to kind of um, look deeper. What's the purpose you want to study? Then you find the right teacher. Uh, I have to say it's the person, the student, then the teacher. Uh, it's not so much what art. There are a lot of art that can take you, you know, very far. Okay. Uh, but it, you could, like to me, when Chen is one of the best art, right? But you could walk into a bad Wing Chun school. That could ruin your whole martial art career, you know, by going to a bad school in the beginning. Okay. So, so number one is not the art. It's about, uh, what, you, what is your initial purpose? And then find the right instructor that can help you. Okay. And then eventually, once you're in the martial art community, you don't want to, you want to get educated. So, like, for me, Wen Chun, if you learn Wen Chun, you understand all martial arts. But if you learn, if this instructor is teaching you this one way, you only, let's say this system is ABC, and all you understand is just ABC, then when you go to meet a, a DEF art, then you completely lost, right? So that means you're not really educated uh, after years of study too. Great, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that reson that kind of resonates with me. I mean, um, I mean, it, I think it's got to be a two way street. Like, if I feel like if a student isn't picking up on something, whether it be the physical side or the the interpersonal side, um, it, it's up to the student to express that to the the teacher what they need help with. But I feel like as a instructor, if if that person's not getting it, I have a responsibility to be a little bit more creative um, to try to find what what language that they they understand mm -hmm. i guess and that is to me that's that's one of the most difficult things um i thought it was interesting what you said so you're going about your goals changing i remember i was 35 when i started and when i started i i was kind of an mma fan and i just wanted to learn that skill set and uh i think kind of in the back of my head i want to be around like-minded people you know that shared um common interests right and so as i got a little bit further into the art i mean you're exactly right i i did find more of a sense of identity and i wouldn't have admitted that i was looking for that um from the get-go i found more of a sense of purpose things started making more sense to me as far as you know why why i might have had conflicts you know with with people you know um so I think that's, uh, yeah, I, evidently my, my leadership, my Sifu, my Sigong, they, they spoke the language that I understood. So hopefully, um, yeah, I, I'm saying this to Nikki, Alex, any of my students, if, if you're struggling with something, let me know and we'll, we have to, you know, work it out. Um, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, but anything else guys? No, sir. All right, Alex, take us out. 